Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Johnny Chung Lee. Uh, let's get the show on the road because I'm sure he has a bunch of stuff to talk about today. Um, I've known Johnny for nearly 10 years now, um, since he was an undergrad at, at, at the University of Virginia, um, already creating a bunch of wacky stuff and, and putting stuff out, up on the web. Um, through the years, it's been amazing watching Johnny grow um, in his research and, and in all the wacky stuff he's been doing. Um, everything from shooting you know, large paintballs at, at buildings, which I'm not sure you're going to talk about, um, to his recent fame with you know, these, these guys hacking the re Wii remotes, uh, which I'm sure he's going to talk about. Um, Johnny interned here in 2005 um, and really got our brain-computer interface uh, projects off the ground. This, this at a time where we were looking at buying some pretty expensive pieces of, of EEG equipment, and Johnny came along and he said, you know, let, let's do this with an off-the-shelf unit that we'll buy from this place called Mind, Body, and, and Soul, I think it was. Um, but, you know, showing that we could do um, very uh, pretty good, interesting pieces of work with very low-end and very cheap and practical equipment um, has been something that, that John, that's run through Johnny's um, research agenda for quite a while. Um, and I think he's going to give us a sense for, for, for a couple of pieces of his work today. Um, so without further ado, Johnny Lee. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Disney. Uh, so yeah, a, a big theme throughout my research and the title of my talk is enhancing the practicality and reachability of interactive technology. So what exactly what do I mean by that? And as researchers, we often use enormous amounts of resources to achieve the effects that we want to get to. And even some of these pictures use wide-angle lenses to kind of emphasize the enormity of these resources. But the problem is that uh, this is essential to the advancement of science, but it creates this kind of situation where if you look at a pie diagram of everyone in the world, this little line is the number of people who can participate in these ideas. And my interest is in this part of the pie chart, and whether they have to be other researchers, other engineers, or just end users. Um, so how do you go about doing this? Well, something that I've done a lot in my work is take advanced concepts, whether or not they exist or not, um, and then looking for opportunities to either simplify their implementation or substantially reduce the system cost. Um, as a result, if you can do this, you get increased participation, which, adva in my, which advances the state of research, in my opinion, uh, and you get increased practicality, which changes the state of technology for everyone. Now, in this talk, I'm actually going to be talking about four examples where I actually ex try to execute this idea. I'm going to spend most of the time on the first idea, first and second idea, and then go over the, the other five. The first project is my thesis work, which is on projector-based location discovery and tracking. Now, we're probably all in this room familiar with using projectors. And we know that to get a nice image, the projector location has to satisfy a series of geometric constraints. And if it doesn't satisfy these constraints, you get a distorted image. So the problem that we have is we want to have a nice image, but a projector pose may not be convenient for that. And the solution, one solution to that, is to somehow fit the projected image onto your target surface. Uh, in the past, this has been done automatically, or attempts to do all this automatically have been using uh, external camera. And then, uh, but to use a camera, you tend to need to have high visibility markers, or and to discover the relationship the camera has with the projector. Uh, or use some sort of uh, m a marking system where you ask the user to register specific points, or you uh, project patterns and use computer vision techniques to uh, recover this geometry. It gets very complicated, uh, and it does work, but it's uh, kind of very involved. And so my solution is to use the technology that's already there, which is the projector. So this brings me to the idea of projector-based location discovery. Uh, it's a very simple idea and has three basic steps. First, you put light sensors into the surface, then you project a series of patterns which uniquely encode every single pixel in the projector space. And then you use that decoded uh, location data in an application. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of that working. OK, so here we have our surface with light sensors into it, uh, embedded in it. Hello? OK. And then we project a series of gray-coded binary patterns. And as I said before, these uniquely encode every single pixel. And the data from the light sensors is reported back to the computer. And once you have the decoded strings of ones and zeros, it gives you the location. And as you can see, you get essentially a pixel-perfect accurate location 
uh, discovery just using the projector and some cheap sensors. Um, I want you, if you use uh, accelerated hardware, you can turn this into an active display using OpenGL or DirectX. And uh, after this, I'm gonna, the video is gonna show you a couple applications. So here, if you're trying to stitch multiple projectors, you can create a grid of these. And then around, around each quad uh, four set of sensors, you calibrate each projector. And then you get a, a method of quickly and accurately stitching multiple projectors. And this scales to large number of projectors, if you'd like. Uh, here's an application where you have one surface, but there's multiple projectors calibrated onto the same area. And as you can, as you can see that from the two shadows. So this is good for touchscreen surfaces, stereoscopic displays, or multi-view systems where you're having light come from multiple directions and they can be viewed. You can also do non-planar surfaces. Uh, so this is a toy car that's been instrumented with eight optical fibers. And we do the same patterning, and then we can discover the correspondence between the fibers, and then augment the appearance of a physical object. Uh, this previously took a 15-minute realignment process, but you can see it just takes a second or two, uh, even if you displace the model or the projector. Um, so this takes these ideas of these projector augmented reality applications and makes them much, much more practical. And you can see the, reg the registration is quite high. Uh, another application that I didn't show, uh, but actually is one of the licensees of this technology, is for doing touch calibration. Uh, for touch calibration, you just need the correspondence of a projector pixel with a physical location. And so you don't need to necessarily use this to distort the projected image. Uh, you can just find the uh, correspondence. And it's been licensed by a major whiteboard manufacturer already. Uh, the benefits of this is, first, you don't need an external tracking system. You don't need a technology to discover locations. The projector provides a location. Uh, there's no calibration to, say, an external camera system because the location data is inherently bound to the projector pixels. Uh, it also has some very nice scalability uh, components related to camera-based tracking, which is uh, you support very large resolutions. Um, the number of patterns you need only goes up logarithmically with resolution. Uh, so if you're talking about speed or computational effort, as you go up in resolution, camera computational power uh, tends to go up relatively linearly versus logarithmically with a projector. You can also support very large sensors. So whether or not you're tracking four sensors or thousands of sensors or millions of sensors, uh, it takes the same amount of time to pattern. And the reliability of discovering the locations stays, um, uh, is unaffected. Versus trying to track camera points, uh, the reliability goes down, especially as the number of points approaches the resolution of the camera. Uh, sensor ID is also inherent to this approach versus camera-based approaches, which don't have sensor ID. Uh, sensors are cheap, and it's also robust against, much more robust against scene complexity or surface geometry complexity. Uh, and it also supports uh, very shallow angles in an unknown optical path. So I'm going to show you another video of the <coughs> robustness of this approach. The robustness of this technique. So this is me reducing the projection angle. And you can see that the calibration continues to work, even at pretty shallow angles. And in this last one, the surface is actually facing slightly away from the projector and the process still works. You can also uh, arbitrarily fold the optical path with a planar mirror and it has no effect on the calibration. So you can f uh, use this in uh, uh, systems uh, easily and the orientation is bound to the surface. Uh, to the, uh, surface. So if you turn the surface upside down, uh, it'll automatically rotate it and it'll automatically reverse it if you put in mirrors in the optical path. Um, well, the computer knows the orientation of the sensors, so it knows uh, it can map it to upper left, upper right. It essentially, it maps the image coordinate on the upper left corner to, the, to sensor one. And so if you place sensor one in a different orientation, it'll rotate the image. Um, the limitations of this prototype, which is the first component of my thesis, is first it's slow. It takes about 20 images to pattern a 1024 by 768 area, and if you're using a 60 hertz projector, this is um, a third of a second. It's also highly caustic. These high contrast patterns are very easy to detect, but uh, cause visual strain upon uh, view of human observers. So ideally, we'd like to be able to do high speed patterning, and we'd like to reduce the perceptibility of these patterns. So we're gonna first talk about reducing the perceptibility. As you can saw in the previous video that I was using these uh, high contrast black and white patterns, and because these are broadband 
uh, light patterns, you can see them with your eye. Uh, a technique that I, do, uh, that I tried to reduce the perceptibilities, instead of using AM modulation or amplitude modulation light, you essentially do frequency modulation. So you have, instead of black and white regions, you have high frequency and low frequency, and we use the exact same patterns. But to a human, these patterns just look like solid gray squares, and this is the light actually coming out of the projector, which can then be demodulated into the original binary um, transmission. Now, to talk about higher speed, uh, this is a very simple idea, which is uh, do incremental tracking. So once you know the base location of each sensor, you can project smaller patterns over each corner and then get incremental updates. A smaller area means fewer patterns, which means faster tracking. Um, there's a lot of technical details about uh, issues related to incremental tracking, but I'm not going to talk about them unless people want me to really dig into that. But I do want to show you a video of it. So here we place a surface uh, into the area, and it looks like a solid gray surface, but the gray coat patterns are being projected. And then once we discover the location, we're tracking each corner. Uh, now remember, there's no tracking system added. It's just the projector that I'm using. So these are just a, a piece of foam core with some sensors built into it. And you can see that it, it retains the angular robustness, so I can actually tilt it up and move it fairly well. Uh, if we add a resistive touch screen, for example, we can turn this little piece of foam core into a tablet PC, essentially. Um, we could use the same technique to track the pen itself. And essentially, using just the projector, you get um, this transformation of functionality. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that in a little future video. So there's an idea of just using it as a web browser, for example. And remember, this is just a piece of cardboard. <laughs> uh, a, an idea that's been in the API community that I'm reproducing here very easily is this idea of magic lenses where you have this physical surface you're moving over two-dimensional data and you get an alternative view of the system of the information. Uh, you also can use a high-resolution display and get multi-variable resolution surfaces. Um, uh, this is a sort of a reproduction of Patrick's uh, focus plus context work where you, so you can move this high resolution screen to an area that you want more detail. Uh, you can also do multiple surfaces with a single projector. and uh, The incremental cost of adding a second surface is only about $10 because you're just paying for the sensors. Um, and you get the geometric relationship between the two surfaces, so you can do location-sensitive display interaction. You know, the arrows are responding to their proximity and distance, uh, or direction and d distance. So as they move further away, the arrows get smaller. And you can do ideas like pouring data onto one surface or another. Uh, you can also, if you, you can track individual sensors to create these sort of physical input devices. Um, Uh, and here's just a simulation idea. Same idea, but just a different uh, concept application. Uh, uh, this was a second step of my thesis, and there are limitations of this as well, which is you lose pixels. I have to tr do these incremental tracking patterns over each corner, and uh, incremental tracking by its under is fundamentally unstable. If you move too fast, for the tracking patterns to keep up, you lose the track, you lose the sensor, and you have to do a full screen recovery. So ideally, we'd like to have full screen application content. We don't want to lose pixels, and we like full screen tracking patterns. And this brings me to the third part of my thesis, which was to build a hybrid projector, uh, which is a single device which can project both infrared and visible light images. The infrared images are for the computer, and the visible images are for the human or for an application. Now, the way this is done is using a, a a light emitting diode or LED illuminated DLP projector. And this is an inside picture of my projector that I built. Uh, this is a pretty low resolution array, meaning, uh, not sorry, low density array, simply because I'm manufacturing them by hand. But a commercial manufacturer is, can easily make very high density LED arrays. Um, the development kit that I had access to also was unfortunately pretty slow. We can only do 180 binary images per second, which means trying to do rapid images for tracking uh, is only sort of a proof of concept with my device. But a production unit in a TV that you might buy in Best Buy today is running at over 50 
thousand binary images per second. So if you had the correct development tools, you could create a very high-speed version of this. And as I said earlier, uh, you can do 1024 by 768 area with 20 binary images. And on a production DMD, this is only 2.4% of the um, duty cycle of a DMD. So if you sacrifice just a little bit of brightness, you get an enormous amount of interactive capability. Uh, the required changes to an existing DLP LED illuminated projector would be very minimal. Instead of an RGB illuminator, you just do RGB IR and you get all this for free. So I'm going to show you a video concept of what this would be like uh, of some using the prototype I built. This uses the assistance of a second projector to do visible content because my prototype is too slow to do both visible and infrared. Uh, but essentially here we have uh, a, a tablet surface uh, or a projected surface where we have multiple touches and you get pen ID for free. Um, you can do uh, two pens, four pens, 10,000 pens and it works okay. If you add a lens to the front of a pen, you can focus the light from a distant surface. And here I'm actually looking at the IR patterns bouncing off these white surfaces. And this gives me accurate tracking on non-planar unknown surfaces. And this is actually hard to do using any other tracking technology if you think through it. Uh, if the Wii remote, uh, I'll talk a little bit about later, but essentially it's a camera looking at IR patterns on the screen. And if you use this projector, you can actually project the necessary IR recognition patterns directly with the surface. Now, the Nintendo just wants two dots, but you could expand this idea to do QR codes or more sophisticated patterns and actually transmit data or transmit display ID. Uh, these are some concept applications that are simulated uh, using higher speed tracking. It's a sort of vision ideas of what you could do once you have this high speed infrared and visible light projector combined. Uh, in 2004, while I was at Merle, uh, we worked on a project which uh, had uh, one of the ideas that was yeah, using a handheld projector where the projector itself provides both the application content but also the input device. So the center of the projector is the cursor and the application is projected around it um, and it registers onto the physical world using these uh, sensors. Uh, this is a, another concept application, which is uh, since we're projecting onto uh, passive surfaces like cardboard, the, flexible, the surfaces don't necessarily have to be rigid. And you can do things like flexible displays. So here's a newspaper concept prototype where you start off with the newspaper <laughs> folded in two ways and you have the New York Times. And if you have the opportunity or the desire, you can simply unfold more screen real estate. And if you have the opportunity, you can unfold it again. So this is the idea of exploring how you can keep a large amount of screen surface area in a very small space. Uh, this is a scroll concept. So you can change the size and the aspect ratio of your display. And when you're done with it, you can keep it collapsed. Yes, you can support in a more complex geometry with more sensors. Um, uh, but mostly what you need is higher speed tracking. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that if you want. Um, this is an umbrella concept where you can essentially create a one square meter display very quickly um, in a small area. And this last one is actually my personal favorite, which is the Chinese fan, because it can literally go into your pocket. And you get nearly a square foot of screen real estate. And it also is interactive, because you, you can track the pen as well as the corners of the surface. Uh, there's some um, orientation sensitivity things you can do. Uh, for example, um, you don't necessarily, you can respond to much more subtle motion behavior such as flipping a surface and you create these two-sided displays. You can also, because it's a computer, you can track it, uh, respond to different directions of flipping and make different things happen. So you could use this to navigate through a book, but then flipping it up and down would go to the table of contents or something like that. Um, so you can do things in real life as impossible. You can also create these uh, essentially simulated lenticulars where it looks slightly different at different angles, but you can also do vertical and horizontal lenticular behavior with a computer. Uh, in a handheld scenario, this may not necessarily seem obvious and why you might want to do this. But in a tabletop scenario, this uh, has a much more uh, implicit 
uh, mapping to usage of the information. So when the display is flat, everyone can see it. It's public. When you lift it up to yourself, it's private. So only you can see it. It's public again. And if you tilt it away so everyone except for you can see it, it, becomes, it turns into this uh, excluded state. Uh, so in summary, this project uh, is a novel method for doing uh, projector-based location discovery and tracking, and it's a unified calibration-free device. Uh, it's pretty cheap, scalable, and robust, and I pr presented a commercially viable prototype that could be uh, in the next generation of projectors if the companies wanted to participate in that. And it significantly re increases the practicality of these augmented reality applications like the Office of the Future Vision or Shader Lamps or Everywhere Displays or Patrick's uh, Focus Plus Context work. And it significantly reduces the cost of these applications because you don't need an external tracking system. Uh, this is a, just a summary of the 15 different applications I showed you for that project. Um, I would normally stop for questions, but for time reasons, I sort of need to move on to my other projects. Um, the second project that is in this idea is the work I did here at Microsoft Research with Disney. And this is the idea of exploring brain research. And the vision of having a computer be able to read our minds is definitely a very popular idea. This is a cover from National Geographic in 2005. And this is actually from the New York Times Magazine, which is from our office. And there's Greg with his wires um, on his head. Um, but the question that we wanted to ask was, what can, be re what can realistically be done with brain technology today? Can we really read minds? And what can be done practically? And this is an important question. Uh, the first one is, uh, you can't read minds yet. But what you can do is get uh, some metrics about engagement or cognitive load or surprise or satisfaction. And these are potentially useful in the near term uh, for things like context-sensitive computing, where the computer knows a little bit about the state of the user and responds appropriately, or for evaluation systems, where you know you want to put the user into a particular state and verify that they're there. Now, what can be done practically? What can be practically done today? Which is a question that's not frequently asked by the traditional brain research community, because they're primarily interested in showing what is possible. Um, so they're willing to use ex very expensive equipment, hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars. Uh, they're willing to use highly invasive surgical procedures to place electrodes into the brain. Uh, also, they're willing to force users to spend very many, many hours or months training with the system. Uh, they're also willing to remove data from poor subjects because they just need to show the po potential possibility. Now, from an HCI standpoint, it's a lot of, it's a high contrast. We'd rather use um, practical resource, uh, reasonable, re sorry, reasonable resources to achieve practical benefits. So we'd like to use pretty affordable equipment, have it be safe and repeated, repeatable uh, for extended use. Um, not require significant user training. We'd rather have the computer do the hard work than the user. And we can, would like it to use, work for a lot of different subjects, if not all subjects. So where do we start? Well, first we need to pick a brain technology. And this is sort of a menu of all the existing technologies. And just due to time constraints, I can't go over all of them. But I can say that these are pretty much mostly impractical for HCI. The only exception on this list would be this FNIR system. And I can talk a little bit more about that if you'd like. But what's left on this list is EEG. And it's safe to use, it doesn't require medical expertise, and it's relatively easy to work with. Now, EEG stands for electroencephalograph. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the brain research, this will definitely be review. But it's essentially measuring the electrical brain activity on the surface of your scalp. It's just volta measuring voltages on your head. And the thing is that it only, it's only measuring gross macroscopic signals that are sort of near the surface. And as a result, most of the interesting a bulk of the activity in the brain is hidden from an EEG. So it's a little bit like uh, holding a microphone up to the side of a PC case. You don't get really a good hook into the data system, but you can perhaps infer a lot of information from your signal. Uh, these are the state of the art, or at least the common systems used in, com in uh, contemporary brain research. And these are very high density EEG systems with uh, 512 sensors or uh, 128 sensors, and they sort of cost in the range of a quarter million dollars down to about 30K. Now, since our interest was what can be done practically, or what was my interest, was how cheap can you make this? What's the cheapest device you can get away with? And this is the cheapest device that you can buy that's FDA approved, and it's called the Brain Master. Uh, and <laughs> uh, it's only $1,500, but it is FDA approved. Um, the technology inside the EEG is not fundamentally complicated, so you could easily manufacture this probably at the $100 or $50 level if you really mass produced it. Um, it's only a two-channel system, and there's um, 
Daniel with his head with the wires on, on, on it. So you can see it's only a two channel system with the electrodes attached to the back. Uh, but the thing is that this was yet to be validated for brain research. But if it works, it significantly lowers the bar for entry for exploring this domain for, for researchers. So first we have to do is validate the device. Can we actually get useful data from this thing? And then we have to validate ourselves or validate our exper experimental procedure. And the way we went about doing this is seeing if we could reproduce some of the results from one of the Keystone um, brain research papers. Um, and this here, this is uh, the description of the experimental design. I'm just going to gloss over this unless you want me to go back in more detail. Uh, but essentially we had them do three mental tasks. One was rest. One was do a mental arithmetic, and one was a spatial rotation task. Uh, we had eight subjects. Um, we chopped up the EEG data into small windows and did some signal processing to get features. And then we did um, a BayesNet classifier to actually do the classification. And the short answer is that this actually does work. It actually does produce useful results. So these are the, ta the classification accuracies for the three-way um, mental tasks where you if you start off in baseline averaging, uh, sorry, the baseline condition, which is the computer only sees what the person is thinking of right now, they get about 85% accuracy if you're trying to determine between two tasks, and 68% uh, accuracy if you're choosing all three-way. Now, if you know a little bit about the task, and you say, well, they've been doing the same thing for the past 10 seconds, you can look at all that data, and then your accuracy gets bumped up, up to as much as 95% if you're doing a two-way classification. Now, when we did this, we observed that there's an inherent linkage between mental activity and physical response. So if you're thinking about something hard, you have an involuntary physiological response, such as sweat, mu muscle tension, and these get picked up by the EEG. This is a problem for neuroscience because they'd like to, they would like to make a cognitive claim for all the signals. They would say, this is really measuring your thought. But, so they have to remove all of these artifacts. But for an HCI community, this may not matter so much. As long as the activity is highly correlated with what you're trying to detect, you might as well use that data in your signal. Um, so some non-cognitive artifacts detected by EEG include eye blinking, eye movement, head movement, or scalpel GSR, which is sweating, uh, jaw and facial EMGs, or gritting your teeth, uh, gross limb movement, and sensory response potentials, which is a really interesting area, and Desney has done a very good job of exploring some of those ideas, uh, extending this work. So if you're going to use this idea of taking advantage of physiological responses in a real world scenario, you might as well have them do a task which involves a little bit of movement. So we had them play a PC based game. We were trying to look for office environments. So this is an activity which requires them to do a fair amount of keyboard and mousing movement. And we had them do again, do three different tasks, rest, which is just sit and relax, play by themselves, navigate the environment, or play against an opponent. And if you're willing to use these physiological signals, the classification accuracy go way up. So, depending on how much information you know about the length of the task, you can get up to 100% accuracy on some, of, on some pairwise classifications. One interesting thing is this um, pairwise classification against solo versus play, whether or not they're playing by themselves or with another opponent. And we can do that with 93.1 accuracy. Now, it's, it's tempting to make a claim that this means that they're more engaged, they're frightened, they're enjoying the game. Um, but we, it's up to the experimenter to be able to make that interpretation. Our, our work basically says you can detect those with a 93.1% accuracy. What that means, it's up to you. Um, so to summarize this project, we showed that low-cost equipment can be used. Uh, there's no significant medical expertise. You, don't, you can do it without it. Uh, and we had presented an experimental design, which is adaptable to future um, work. And you can see in some of the Desney's continuing work that there was a nice uh, references or adaptations of our existing experimental procedure. And if you're willing to embrace cognitive artifacts, which you kind of have to if you're, willing, if you're going to be using uh, healthy subjects, uh, they can improve your classification accuracy. So again, this significantly reduces the cost and increases the reachability of BCI research to not only the research community, but to potential engineering groups as well. So project three. These are interaction techniques with the Wii Remote. Now, most of you probably know, but the Nintendo Wii is a game console that was released uh, at the end of 2006. And as of uh, Q4 2007, they've sold over 2 million units worldwide. And why this is interesting to me, and please correct me if you're wrong and you're from the tablet PC group, but from my estimation that I could find on the web, there are about 6 to 9 million tablet PCs sold or in use in the world. But there are over 20 million Wii remotes 
in, in use. And if you're talking about the fact that a console can have one to four remotes, this is substantially higher than 20 million. So this becomes one of the most uh, common as well as one of the most sophisticated input devices that you can connect to a computer today. Now, my interest with this, I decided to create three different tutorial videos on YouTube, um, and they've received over five million views in less than eight weeks. Um, and the software for this has been downloaded 400,000 times. And just out of curiosity, how many of you guys have seen one or more of these videos? Okay, so that's most of you. Um, I'm gonna show clips from those videos, but I'll try to keep them brief because most of you have seen them. Uh, the Wii Remote is what I'm holding and I'm actually using to control my presentation. Um, is a Bluetooth compatible HID joystick. And it's only cost $40 and it has a, a litany of input, out, input capabilities and output capabilities. But in the videos that I showed, uh, mostly take advantage of the infrared camera that's in front of the Wii Remote. And it's a manufactured by this company called Pixart Imaging. Uh, it has included into it uh, hardware blob tracking for up to four points. So there's no computer vision you have to do if you're building applications for it. Uh, resolution of 1024 by 768 with a 100 hertz update rate. Uh, this is pretty impressive specs if you've been used to using webcams for doing computer vision. And Nintendo gives you this sensor bar, which actually isn't a sensor, but includes two groups of infrared emitters, and you get two points from the camera. Now, if you're using it the way Nintendo wants you to, with a moving camera and stationary IR points, you essentially get uh, tilt, yaw, and roll of the, you get orientation of the remote with a little bit of distance data. But if you keep the camera stationary and you move the IR points, you get X, Y, Z, you get translational data, and then roll for the, for the two points. Well, the first project I did with this is to do just basic finger or object tracking. And this is a little bit like a single camera low end version of uh, Vicon motion capture systems, where you put a bright IR emitter around the camera, and that pushes light onto the space, and you put a little reflector dot, and that reflects the light back into the camera, and you can see them. So I'm gonna show you a video of that. So here I have this little reflective tape on my finger, and there's the Wii Remote and the IR LED array on top of my TV. So now I can track fingers in arbitrary um, space. If I use, and I can also generate events by curling my finger. Now, of course, I can use two fingers, uh, and then I can do sort of these multi-touch mid-air interactions, and you can actually do up to four dots with the Wii Remote. Um, now we've all seen some of the classic uh, uh, applications of two-point interaction where you create this navigation space where you can control both the rotation, scale, and translation of a two-dimensional surface. Now, there are obviously limitations of this, things like only four points, uh, uh, there's no interactive cursor feedback, arm fatigue from how waving your hands, and then unintentional reflections from having an IR emitter. I can walk through some of these, but there are also ways to get around them, and I can talk about these if you'd like. Um, the second project was uh, creating interactive whiteboards using the Wii Remote. And this is essentially the idea of you point the camera at a surface, you can map the camera coordinates to the projector coordinates and do a touch calibration, and then you in simulate a mouse cursor with the IR points. And this effectively gives you an electronic whiteboard system for about $50. Now, the software has been downloaded over 200,000 times, and it's already in use by a large number of educators around the world. Um, particularly in developing countries who can't afford to spend $3,000 $3, on an electronic whiteboard and even a lot of school districts. And there's actually the Global Solidarity Fund recently contacted me, which is a European organization for reducing the digital divide in, in countries um, for education. And they're interested in massively delivering this in Africa to students. Uh, the nice thing also is that it tracks up to four points, so you can track four pens simultaneously. Uh, and it works for any planar surface display technology. So let me show you that. So here I just do a four point touch calibration and the Weaver mode is pointing at this projection screen and that's all you need to do and now um, you have an electronic whiteboard system. And because this emulates a mouse, it works with all existing Windows application applications. So uh, I've seen lots of videos of people posting responses to my YouTube video of them playing games or uh, doing work or navigating scientific data. 
Uh, the nice thing is that since it's a projector, you can project onto any surface, and uh, you can do the calibration onto a tabletop, onto a floor, onto your chair or wall, and it turns it into an electronic whiteboard. And it's a multi-touch system as well. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit, but so you don't have to use it with just a projector. You can use it with any planar display technology like this. So here I just turn uh, a LCD display into a multi-touch tablet surface. For those of you who actually know, this is already a tablet PC, but um, <laughs> here I actually show it's multi-touch, which you can't do with a tablet PC normally. Now, of course, there are limitations of this as well. This particularly the tracking resolution is not going to be as good as a commercial system, but it's also less than 10% of the price. Um, so it's pretty good for its cost. Um, it's also sensitive to occlusion, so if you get in front of the camera, you, it loses track of the pointer, so it breaks down. Uh, so camera position is critical to getting good tracking. And actually, if you have the opportunity to create a rear projected surface, this is a really, that's the best uh, arrangement, because then you can give the Wii Remote a uh, prime view of the surface and you can maximize your tracking resolution. Now the third idea uh, is doing head tracking. Now if you track a rigid pair of IR, sensor, IR emitters, you essentially get XY position, XYZ position of the head relative to a display. And this allows you to create motion parallax sensitive displays, which was true and truthfully uh, explored by Sutherland back in the 60s. But what's new is that the hardware to do this is pretty much, most of the hardware to do this is already in 20 million homes because of the popularity of the Wii Remote. And as a result, uh, over six major game studios have already contacted me and is, is to, are looking into making games for this using this technique. So let me show you a video of that. So this is what tracking, what 3D displays and games normally look like now. You know, it's a 3D image, but it looks like it's locked to the surface of the display. And this is what it looks like with head tracking. You essentially can render a new viewpoint depending on the relationship the head has to the display, and you get this very strong sense of depth um, to it. Some of the targets actually look like they're in front of the screen. The front target actually is, is sort of in the same plane as my laptop, which is almost two feet in front of the screen. And if we get really close, we can actually get our head behind the front target. A good question. Um, it, it weakens the effect in real life, but if you're com in working with compelling content, uh, it, at least it's just sort of a qualitative uh, study you could do. But there's a Kai paper, which I'll mention, which says that motion parallax is more important than stereo uh, performance. Yeah. What about the cognitive um, competition that sometimes operates on people's stomachs if there's no correlation? So the nice thing about this is that it's not peripheral. And at least my experience with, uh, oh, sorry, this is showing that you can actually still use the Wii Remote in its intended operation if you use a second pair. So you can actually do this to play games in a realistic way. <laughs> uh, and you can also see that the viewpoint is incorrect for any observer that's not wearing the glasses because it's only tracking it for that one person. You could do things like split screen or do shutter glasses to support multiple people, but the hardware costs go up. Uh, I have not experienced any sort of nausea from using this. I mean, this is, again, you just need to have people work, play with it and see what happens. Uh, my experience is that most of the nausea comes from the peripheral information, and uh, this doesn't have that, and so that, uh, in my, my experience, it doesn't happen so much. And the tracking rate of the Wii Remote is 100 hertz, so the, la the latency is pretty low already. Um, now, this is where I mentioned the reason why this works is that you get motion parallax, and objects closer to you move faster. And this is the Kai paper that did a, a task study where they gave um, people either stereo vision or they had motion parallax, and they performed substantially better when they just had motion parallax. So bang for the buck, this will give you a better immersion experience than stereo. Um, limitations of this works for one person and conflicting stereo depth cues, um, uh, and you can't touch objects, sorry. But you, what you can do is you can keep all your objects behind the surface of the screen and then just blame the glass on your screen. Um, there's a limited tracking volume, so you could do, but you could use multiple Wii remotes to uh, handle that. And uh, if you're willing to give them stereo glasses, uh, you can overcome this conflicting information, and then you can have, make a really compelling experience. Or you can make a pirate game and give everybody eye patches. <laughs> um, removing 
the stereo, kind of the conflicting stereo information enhances the effect. So this is your cheap way to do it. Does it really? If you, if you put an eye patch on it, actually it's more impressive. Yeah, I mean, it, it, because it looks, it feels just like the video, it feels like it's really there. And you get into the situation where you start reaching for objects, and I th it's fun. <laughs> You can uh, trade off the um, uh, refresh with uh, multiple. Yes, yeah, so you could time multiplex stuff, and you could get multiple users. points and multiple users. Yeah, uh, it gets a little bit tricky because you know the software needs to be smarter, and uh, they're more likely to break down. But yeah, you could definitely throw more algorithms at it and get more performance out of it. <laughs> uh, it does a little bit. That's true. Um, so in summary. These three projects I've shown, again, significantly reduce the cost of achieving these ideas in someone's home and increases their accessibility. There are already hundreds of people on the web that have documented their reuse of this. So the number of people who have actually played with it is hard to count. Uh, and as I said, it's in use by educators in classroom already today, and Game Studio is already developing games for it. Project 4 is a project I did back in 2002 called Kinetic Typography. And Kinetic Typography is the art and technique of expression with animated type. And this was coined by Suguru Ishizaki back in 1996. And uh, roughly, it means adding the qualities of the spoken word to text. And you do this by giving life to it through animation. And uh, I'm going to show you an example created by a design student that, to me, particularly inspired me to get into this work. So that work was created by Hibok Lee, who I believe is making a very good living doing movie titles now <laughs> for a good reason. I remember this is eight years ago. So we've seen a lot of animation in the recent things, but this is uh, when it was still pretty new. Um, but the problem actually of authoring these things still exists today. Um, the, and they require an intense amount of manual export work. Uh, he was doing, we were doing the, tools, the tools at the time were Adobe After Effects, and then a few years later, uh, Apple Motion came out. And these tools don't scale well to large number of objects, which happened in these kinetic typography systems, where you have, uh, they do well with dozens of items, maybe. But when you get into hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands, these tools simply don't scale. Um, a keyframe animation is also very brittle. You define hard points in space, and if you need to modify an animation a little bit, you generally need to go back through and touch every keyframe. Uh, it also is not very easy to create variations upon a single animation. Uh, you need to, again, manually do all the adjustments. And of course, interactive and dynamic content is fundamentally, fundamentally not supported in most of these tools. These are all offline tools, so you can't do things like interactive chat. So my work was to create a kinetic typography engine, essentially a software library that was designed specifically for supporting animation for text. Um, and it primarily, uh, it, introduced, it showed the 
it took an object uh, object oriented approach to animation so you could get things like reuse um, variability and inheritance in animation and so the idea is you have a text object with some XYZ rotation size properties and if you want to make it move over time you apply an object of uniform change to one of the properties and it acts as sort of a filter uh, with time input and position output and the nice thing about this is once you're willing to make this leap you get a bunch of nice properties like additive composition where you can create a moving wiggling object simply by saying wiggle and then move um, you can also create a dampen spring approach by adding uh, oscillate behavior and then uh, add a curve uh, behavior to the amplitude and this will make it slow down. So the key framing this would be very difficult but it's very simple to operationalize these in object oriented animation. Uh, you can also do things like simulation or mathematically driven uh, act behaviors or secondary effects um, and these a lot of these ideas were introduced uh, from an animation standpoint to the computer graphics community by John Lasseter in 1987 and then the important thing the difference between having an object system versus uh, just a pure simulation system based off keyframes is that you can object objectify a movement and the uh, the, comp the computed things can be proactive uh, they know uh, the intent of the object and thus add a lot more life to it which is essential to some of the animation techniques of making things seem alive uh, once you also have a structured animation, uh, because it's programming, uh, or it has a programmatic arc structure to it, you can do high reuse. So you can, once you define an animation, you can shove an entire book through it, and you can animate that quickly. Uh, and the variations can be driven by word, character, part of speech, grammar, for example. And it also works for dynamic sources like chat. Uh, we also explored a quick idea of Kinetit, which was taking a text editor metaphor to animation, really prioritizing the idea of uh, the text component of it. It definitely has a certain limitations, but it was an interesting exercise that may have some benefits of exploring that further. Uh, so in general, this doesn't replace an animator at all. And in fact, the whole kinetic typography engine is still compatible with keyframe animation. So you could hop back and forth between the two if you'd like. And it simplifies, it increases the accessibility of kinetic type. There's, I think, over seven research papers and uh, several hundred students that have used this in classroom projects at CMU. Uh, I made the engine available for download. And uh, it simplifies large semi-repetitive anim animations and uh, supports interactive sources. So project five, these last two are going to these last few are going to be really short. Um, I have to, the world is becoming very touchscreen oriented. You know, we have the Apple iPhone, and the Microsoft Surface, but the physical touch of the world is incredibly important to the way we interact and relate to our environment. And when we normally think of haptics, we think of devices like this, especially in a pen form vector, which is the phantom uh, haptic feedback device. And it's a $2,000 device. But in 2003, Sony Research had this very, very nice paper where they put a little piezo element behind a small touch screen. And when you press a, a software button, it vibrates the screen and provides you a very compelling experience that you're pushing a physical button. Now, the problem with this, I mean, it's great. But one limit, some limitations of it is you only can do one touch. So it doesn't work with these multi-touch surfaces. It also only works for one person and only for small screens. Since it's a physical vibration of the entire screen, you can't do tabletop surfaces. Well, it's not, it's not eyes-free either. So you're yeah. using Yeah, you can't really feel the buttons. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I agree that ideally you'd like to make it like feel like real buttons in, in essence. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I'd be, part, I'd be willing to be part of a project that explored that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my goals when I did this, or came to this, and I had worked with this with colleagues at Murrow, like Paul Dietz, um, which we wanted to support very large touch screens and support multiple users. And uh, so one, the, our solution to this was to come up with a haptic pen, which is essentially a, a handheld device that has the feedback built into it. And essentially, uh, you get a lot of nice advantages from this. First of all, it's an aftermarket device, so you can add it onto an existing touch screen. Um, you get hovering data, which you don't get with some touch screen technologies. And you can do pressure sensitivity, so you can vary the feedback based on how hard the person is pushing. Um, so we create a little uh, GUI interface with eight different buttons at all. I have eight different fields to them. Um, in particular, the pressure sensitivity adds a nice feature that we didn't quite expect, which is we can actually do things, not only make soft buttons and stiff buttons, but we can do things like add multi-level buttons, a little bit like the camera button, the camera shutter button on your camera. You can put it halfway down to get focus and then push it all the way down for commit. Uh, doing this without haptic feedback is very difficult, but with haptic feedback, it's quite easy. And uh, we added a solenoid 
the way we did our feedback is by adding a solenoid onto the back of the pen, and that's actually coaxial with the pressure tip. And it turns out by doing this, you get extremely realistic renderings of physical button sensations. So these are two different buttons, a stiff button and a light button, and this is accelerometer data measuring the vibration of the pen. And this is pushing an actual button that we measured, and this is our haptic pen simulation. And then this is a stiff button, an actual stiff button, and this is our haptic pen simulation. And as you can see, the, the motion and force profiles are extremely similar. And any differences are sort of in the kilohertz range, which is above human perception. Um, there's a demo that we r I really wanted to do, but we never got around to doing it, which is combining the haptic pen with the Noto tracking technology, which is essentially tracking pen location on paper. And this would essentially give you the capability to draw a button and then push it like it really existed. Um, so in summary, coaxial feedback provides very much more realistic uh, feedback than vibration motors. And you can also get realistic feedback without reflective force haptic feedback. So as a result, it's much, much cheaper to do. Uh, project six um, was an audio work I did back in, at USC. Um, if you're creating a modern entertainment experience or immersive simulation experience, audio is a very big component of that. But to create these audio experiences, it requires an expert to collect a lot of resources, mix them together, and toward a particular target, like 5.1 channel systems or stereo systems. Um, but there are a lot of different targets a person can have. They can have stereo, 5.1, 7.1, or some experimental system, like a 10.2 channel system, or just simply uh, a misarranged mis 5.1 system. And the thing is, if you're using the existing standard, uh, you have tools there are that it will pan out a source to these uh, speakers. The problem is that these algorithms make extremely rigid assumptions about speaker location and listener location. And again, uh, also mixing a 7.1 master down to five channels or two channels is not a straightforward process. It generally requires custom algorithms that have to be hand massaged. And of course, if you're using a non-standard configuration, you're out of luck. You have to create your own tools or just manually do all the panning for you, uh, which requires, again, intense manual work and uh, make significantly rigid assumptions about the environment, and you get rigid results. So if you make something for a 10-channel system, you can't immediately play it back as it's meant to be heard on an eight-channel system. This is a little bit like painting with pixels. You know, you each slider, you sort of define its value and you animate it. What we'd rather have is a, you know, a rendering algorithm or simulation of the environment, a little bit like computer graphics, where we simply define our light sources, our sound sources, and then uh, render that out to the output that we have. Now again, this is not in a replacement for an artist who is very skilled at this, but significantly increases power. So the great work I did was to come up with a general rendering algorithm where you keep your sound parameters in 3D, you also keep the speaker parameters in 3D, and you can pan out a sound source to an arbitrary arrangement of speakers. The nice thing is that down mixing and up mixing are inherent, so if you remove a speaker, the algorithm, as long as it's updated, can repan it. Uh, it also supports listener movement or speaker movement, and this is important for simulations. So it simplifies these installations, reduces the complexity of authoring these environments, uh, increases the portability, so now you can dynamically mix down to different environments or mix up, and it supports interactive environments. Now the last project is a little project, but I'm particularly proud of it, uh, which is a $14 Steadicam. Um, Steadicams are an essential piece of filmmaking equipment, and um, Professional version costs around 6K to 10K, um, and even uh, consumer knockoffs sort of are in the $600 version. Uh, in college, when I was a film student, I wanted to make my own version, and I went to the hardware store, got some parts, and it turns out you can make an effective one for about $14. It's not $14 oh, did you try to make one? No, or? I, I went the Oh, okay. So, yeah, these are in $2,000, which is depressingly more than $2,008. Um, anyway, but I made it to, t I decided to document this process and make a tutorial online. And it's received well over 1.1 million views, not including syndication, of which I know there are a lot. And it actually spawned me to start a little company manufacturing these, and it's done over a quarter million dollars in sales for selling these steady cams for people who can't build them for themselves or don't want to. Uh, it's again, it's become a staple of the independent and student filmmaking community. It's actually standard issue equipment in some high schools and college um, uh, film programs. So again, this significantly reduces the cost, increases the reachability of this technological capability. Uh, it was also in the premier issue of Make Magazine, and uh, was rec the article was recognized by the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in their Design Life Now Triennial. So 
going back, oh, that line line's not supposed to be there. Ignore this for the moment. Uh, so th going back to this idea, my interest is in expanding the number of participants and getting this group of people working with technology. And I enjoy creating technology that is accessible, reachable, practical, empowers the masses, and in effect increases the participation of people with the technology and advances the state of humanity. And you can't do this by making 10%, 20% improvements upon a technology. You need two to three orders of magnitude. And I measurably think I've done that in some of the projects I presented here. So what next? Well, personally, I don't think we're really done until we have the Star Trek holodeck, um, which may sound silly, but I think it actually has a can be operationalized a lot of it. And particularly, I think it's interesting to think, uh, see that it's not really a computer graphics problem anymore. These are what we can do with real-time graphics this century. And you know, these are photorealistic from as far as 90% of the population actually cares. The bottleneck from getting us into this environment is through immersion and interactivity. So this is where I think all the interesting things are gonna happen. And I think a, a compelling precursor to the holodeck are some of these technologies that we see in these sci-fi movies and animations of these summonable displays, biometric input devices, or these surfaces which provide the, a compelling illusion of presence of a virtual human being or remote human being. And actually a lot of the projects I presented here uh, sort of accidentally, but uh, probably drive a lot of my uh, internal research goals, actually help realize a few of these or at least take a step toward them. Sorry. Uh, so. Actually, I already have at least a dozen other project ideas either expanding upon these or are related to things that Disney's doing or Andy Wilson's doing or Xbox or Surface um, that I would like to immediately execute. Um, some near-term applications of this rather than reaching to the future is either more compelling entertainment or simulation environments. These are sort of the military uses of simulators and planning and these are more of the um, uh, consumer uses or civilian uses probably, which is medical technology. This is an interesting AR project where they project an x-ray over top of your body and the, this essentially gives surgeons an x-ray vision or for data visualization. I've actually had a number of medical people interested in using the head tracking technology and pen technology to help with this. Another way I look at technology or look for interesting places to do to work is by looking at essentially where computing is going. This is our standard model of computing today, but if it's very easy to see that computing is looking a lot more like this. The phone, in the car, in the living room. The most powerful computers in a household today is often frequently in the living room. And also in kids' toys. Uh, and if you just think about, I don't know how much exposure they have to kids' toys, but I'm always surprised that the my toys my nephew has and how computationally powerful some of them are. In particular, I think there's a lot of attention in the phone. So I think there's actually relatively hard to make easy engineering wins there. But the car, the experience in these environments are still extremely disparate. It's mostly individual companies trying to experiment with ideas and they're mostly bad ports of keyboard and mouse technology or interfaces and shoving them into these environments. In particular, I think the car is interesting because it has a lot of, I look at problems, problems like an engineer and if you, look, if you look at the car, you have very few size, weight and power constraints. So you can explore a lot of the ideas that wearable technology is trying to do very easily. It's highly correlated with driver location, so you don't have to instrument people. Um, constrained user positions, you know where they are in the car, you know approximately how they're sitting, so it simplifies the instrumentation. There's also an opportunity for deep integration because you can touch all the components in the car, and it's extremely task-oriented, so you can create computational assistance to these. Uh, and you get situational impairment, which is important for evaluating technologies because you have a bar of success, essentially. Uh, and there's also safety and efficiency, but I'm not talking about mechanical safety and efficiency. I'm talking about things like improving attention, reaction time, or creating cooperative driving, which can be done with computation. So thanks for watching my talk. These are a summary of the projects I've worked on, and thanks. <laughs> oh, and I forgot to highlight this very important section of my collaborators, many of which are in this room, uh, who helped make these projects happen. Some time for questions. So this is bringing broadcast. So if you have a question, please grab this so that folks on online can uh, actually hear you. Yeah. Um, fascinated by the uh, uh, the LED projector uh, um, interaction. Have you considered using the white segment in many of the rotating filter 
DMDs today? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, that's an opportunity to just blast IR through that full segment. Uh, the problem we ran into when, we were, when I was trying to do that or explore that idea was that there's a lot of near IR cutoff filters in existing projector. So if you, you have the opportunity to blast out the IR patterns in that white segment, but you still have to change some of the rest of the optics so the near IR will make it out the lens. Right, you, well, so. but that white segment is fairly easy to, um, to, to an add, add a filter if you wanted to. Plus, yeah. plus you can predict the um, 10 microsecond uh, mirror response within that. So you could, do a, you could probably do a, a complete 10 to 20 frame uh, sub-segment within that white segment. Yeah, definitely, yep. So it's easy. We just need a projector company to do it. <laughs> You're creative. <laughs> Other questions? I know a bunch of you actually have meetings with Johnny later today, but here you go. Hi. In, in one of your um, examples, you had the, the two touch s screens. They seem to be reversed or at least not mirrored with the screen. That oh, the finger tracking? Yeah, the finger there. tracking. Uh, was there a reason that you didn't mirror it ag against the screen versus um, it seemed to be reversed? Um, that was mostly a tech demo to show the public how to use their Wii as a diagnostic tool. So that's just using the application on the Wii, and it doesn't do the mirroring. But in the later software demos where I'm writing my own software, I reverse it so it matches correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.